You're listening to the Doc Lounge Podcast. This is a place for candid conversations with healthcare industry's top physicians, executives, and thought leaders. This podcast is made possible by Pacific Companies, your trusted advisor in physician recruitment. I am your host, Summer Gilbert, and I am the Director of Marketing and Branding here at Pacific Companies. And today, my co-host is our EVP of Training here at Pacific Companies, Mr. Chris Call. Today on the podcast, we are honored to have back with us Dr. Michael Young Lee. Dr. Lee is a family medicine physician working out of Southern California. His last episode with us was on burnout and then we had COVID. So what a perfect time for that episode to come out. This episode today, we talked to him about starting at an HMO setting at Kaiser Permanente and moving to a private group setting and what that was all about. And then we end the podcast talking about emotional resilience, which is so important today. And he quotes some wonderful things from Brene Brown, which we're all fans of here. So without further ado, let's start our episode with Dr. Michael Young Lee. Thanks, Dr. Lee, for being here. Uh, first, you know, for a medical student, let's say, trying to figure out what they want to do, uh, if you could kind of give some characteristics of a, a, a good, you know, family medicine, because a lot of the docs, you know, they're, they're in medical school, like, well, what should, what's my calling? What insights could you give them to help them make a good selection? Definitely. No, Chris, that's a great question. And that's probably like the million dollar question, you know, just because I can't tell you how many med students and it's so tough because they're asked to determine like the future of their next however many years of their career within just a year or two of trying out some different rotations that they do for a couple of weeks or a couple of months and in medical school training. So, you know, I'll tell you um, with primary care, I I always think of it as it's very, um, you know, people interaction oriented. So if you're an extrovert, if you're someone who likes to communicate, talk to people, you know, get to know them on a deeper level, then primary care is actually a great option for you. If, if you're more of an introvert and, you know, you don't really care as much about those interactions and you like to do more, you know, other things, then maybe doing a more procedural brace specialty or even something like radiology, you know, something like that might be more, uh, you know, more for you. But, you know, I think a lot of it actually, I'll tell you, has to do with self-awareness. You'd be surprised at how many people um, go into specialties, but don't even even really understand what they like or what they don't like. And they just kind of go into something because they sort of have this sort of vision or idealistic sort of attitude that or mentality that I'm going to save the world and, you know, or that I want to do all these things. And then they go into their specialty and they're miserable because they just didn't take that t- extra time to really think about what are the things I enjoy? What are the things I don't enjoy? What are the things I'm looking for in the next 10 to 20 years of my career? And then making a call based on that. And so I think a lot of it's just kind of knowing who you are and what kind of things are interest you before you really think about a specialty. And I always tell people, like, although you want to think about lifestyle and work, um, that I know those shouldn't always be the primary things because you can have the lifestyle you wanted, but if you're miserable doing what you're doing, that might not be fun because I, I know work. I have some... Yeah, it doesn't work. I have some colleagues who I think would have been great surgeons and they love surgery, but they just didn't go into it because they were so f- scared of the lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Um, and now they're doing primary care. They're doing some other specialty and very unhappy when I think they would have been really happy going into some sort of surgical specialty. You know, so I would tell people like oftentimes you can shape practices and even though it might be a little bit more demanding in some ways, if you're doing something that you love or that you really enjoy, it's going to really make up for some of those things that you feel like you might be missing out and not necessarily missing out on, but just kind of finding that that balance that you can find in that way. Does it take a long time to switch specialties if you are a doctor and you're in something? It it can. I'll tell you, it can just because of residency training can be a couple of years. And then the other thing is some of these residencies are very competitive. So it may be challenging even getting into some of them. But I'll tell you, if you're in your first or second year of residency and you realize, oh my gosh, this is not for me. Like, you know, primary care wasn't what I thought it was going to be, or, you know, um, you know, pathology or whatever it is, um, then I would say do it and make and be bold and be courageous and try to make that change. Because I I always tell people the earlier you can do that and the earlier you 
find that you're not happy what you're doing, the better it's going to be because you're talking about investing in the next 30 years of your life, you know? And so Mm -hmm. again, if it's something where you're going to have to put in a picture for years. So I've had friends who did one specialty, realized they were unhappy and actually went back and did another residency in that other specialty and are just so much happier five to 10 years later down the line versus just being permanently miserable doing something that you don't really enjoy in that way. Right. Now, out of training, I noticed, Dr. Lee, that you accepted a position with the National Health Service Corps. Yes. Uh, Why did you select this position over others? I'm sure you had a lot of suitors after your skill set. Why was (laughs) it here? You know, I really enjoyed working with the underserved um, at the time. And especially before I went into medical school, I really did a lot of, I did a lot of volunteering with the homeless population, with some of the underserved population. And I really enjoyed that aspect of it. So I kind of, I just knew that um, I wanted to do something with the underserved. And I just, the National Service Corps was great because it paid for my medical school education and really just um, allowed me to commit and make a commitment to committing time with the underserved. Because I think if I didn't, it's very easy to get sucked into a job that you're just not not that you're in it for the money, but that salary does play a big role. And sometimes you can kind of lose sight of your ideologies in that way of why you went into medicine. So that's why the National Service Corps was great for me because it, it made me commit to wanting to serve that population for a couple of years. And I can't tell you the learning I got out of it was amazing because, I mean, it was crazy. You're working with a lot of patients who don't have health insurance, who don't have a lot of things. So you're the go-to for everything. And so it was probably the best learning curve out of residency for me to be able to work with that population. And, um, and then now going anywhere else, after that, it is not as scary or stressful for me. Because if you can do that, I'll tell you, like you can go, th- you can manage and handle a lot of other types of practices for sure. Right. I noticed mm-hmm. um, when we visited with you previously, you you've done a lot of work uh, in your previous job at Kaiser, mm-hmm. which you're no longer at. Right. But you were doing work with residents and kind of bringing them along. How'd that come about? Did you always have that kind of interest to give back, like you just mentioned with the service corps? Definitely. I, what I notice a lot of times with my colleagues is that there are so many things that you learn as you're practicing and you're like, man, I wish someone had just told me this stuff back when I was a resident. And so, you know, I think having those things, it really made me want to go back and share with the residents, like all the things I learned, like it was really fun. I, I did a personal, I do a personal finance talk for the residents. Like, I'm like, I wish someone would have given me a personal finance talk and told yeah. me about what the difference between like a 401k is and a Roth and all these things that, you know, and I, I go back and do a talk on like wellness and, um, you know, and how to set boundaries. And so I think, you know, again, these are all things that I wish someone had done for me when I was a resident. So that's kind of part of why I enjoyed being part of the residency training and, you know, just being able to just be a mentor and being able to guide them was one of the most favorite things I really enjoyed while I was at Kaiser at that time. So you felt vested there, but three years ago, you had a, a change. <laughs> Uh, and you went to one medical. Yeah. What was that change that one medical attracted you from maybe the next step in your career? You know, I, I think I got to an age where I was just thinking like, what else is out there? It would have been very easy for me to just stay and just in, enjoy, not enjoy, but keep my practice there, keep my panel and do that until I retire. But I think for me, it was a lot of it had to do with intellectual curiosity of just thinking like, I kept hearing all these things from my friends who were outside of Kaiser, like all these healthcare changes. And being at Kaiser, I, I have to admit, I was very sheltered from a lot of what was happening on the outside in terms of the healthcare landscape. And for someone like me, who's interested in policy, who's interested in how things are going outside, I really wanted to just, just make a break, take a change. And I don't, I don't know if you want to call it a midlife crisis. I haven't bought my motorcycle <laughs> yet, but no, I'm just kidding. But like, but, uh, but definitely like, I think it, it, it was something where I just felt like if I was going to do it, I had to do it now because obviously the older you are and the more vested you are. And as a partner, it, it kind of the harder it is to leave. So I think for me, it just got to a point where I just had to be courageous, take a move. And thankfully I had the support of my family, which was huge that I was able to do that. And so yeah. I was very grateful that I had that opportunity. Great. Yeah. Now, I know you, you seem to have a, a great interest in this term, emotional resiliency. Mm-hmm. Um, I think you're a resident expert on that. Could you go into your thought process on that for our listeners? <laughs> For sure. And actually, when I was at Kaiser and actually outside of Kaiser, I'm, I did a lot of coaching for burned out physicians. So, you know, if there was a burned out colleague or a physician, I would definitely reach out to them. And, you know, we, and that was a nice thing about um, SCPMG was that they really wanted to support, and especially here in Orange County, they really wanted to do what they could to support their physicians. And so um, it was a great opportunity for people to get to meet out there and meet with them and just kind of, and what I noticed as a pattern was that, you know, as a lot of physicians were 
we're very hard on ourselves. And so it really opened my window to a concept called self-compassion, which is huge to me. Because, you know, if you think about it, how many times a day do you beat up on yourself? Ah, I suck. I'm so stupid. What was I thinking? I'm a horrible parent. I'm a horrible physician. I'm a horrible, you know what I mean? Like, think about how many times you do that. And it, it takes a toll on you. And, Mm -hmm. you know, and I I think it's very hard. And then how many of us as physicians, and I'm sure you may hear it in the physicians you talk to, suffer from imposter syndrome. You know, like, I'll be honest with you, I would, I definitely suffered from it. I was an anthro major in undergrad. If you wanted to talk about, you know, any type of like other, other thing, writing essays and things like that, that was probably one of my things that I was good at. But when it came to doing organic chemistry or biochemistry, it was definitely not one of my strengths. So there are many moments I suffered from, like, am I smart enough to be here? Am I smart enough to be a doctor? And so I think having some of those things um, really affected my emotional sort of uh, state of mind and my resiliency, especially the early years of my practice, where I think I was constantly berating myself for, you know, making mistakes, not doing this, uh, you know, taking everything personally every time I got a bad patient satisfaction score. And I think those things can definitely take a toll on you over time. Do you think that, you know, that holding yourself accountable, if anything, is um, more difficult for, let's say, the, the younger doctors that grew up in social media and is always worried about how people like them? With the older doctor, maybe not necessary. Is there a a difference between that older and younger doctor? with what you just discussed? You know, that's a great question, Chris. And I'll tell you, it's hard to know, but I would definitely say that I think social media has made us even more sensitive um, regarding a lot of the comments that we get. If you think about Yelp reviews, like if you think about, you know, Facebook and Instagram and all these things, it definitely uh, is harder, I think, for this younger generation because there's so many um, places where they can get criticized or commented on or whatnot. So I think we're much more self-conscious in that sense too as well. But I'll tell you, I think overall, it's really hard. You know, one of the things that um, when it comes to the emotional resiliency was just learning how not to take things so personally. I think I used to be that if someone, you know, a specialist talked to me differently, or I felt like they were being discouraging or very like condescending, I would take that very personally. And so I think one of the things that I had to learn over time was learning not to take things so personally and really challenging the stories that my mind would make up. So, you know, if, if you ever, if you know Brene Brown, she's an amazing um, woman who's done a ton of TED Talks and written a bunch of books. And one of the things, um, if you ever get a chance, her book Rising Strong is really, really powerful. And she talks about sort of emotional triggers. And then just, uh, again, and she calls it a three-step process of uh, emotional triggers is when you know you're triggered. You know, um, somewhere, you know, like, give me a, like, if you think about an example where you get emotionally triggered by something that someone close to you does or a coworker, you know, someone that walks right by in front of you and doesn't say hi to you. You know what I mean? It's like anything like that can be a trigger. And then once you know you're triggered, then to know how to, ru- she calls it rumbling is a second stage where rumbling is kind of like challenging the story that your mind makes up. So I'll give you an example. Let's say, Chris, I see you, we're good friends. And you literally just walk right by me and don't say hi to me. Within milliseconds, my amygdala, this is the emotional intelligence part, sets off a fight or flight trigger, which then my brain will make up a story to justify why my amygdala got triggered. So my brain within milliseconds will say, oh, Chris is mad at me because I didn't invite him out last night with the guys, you know, or something. Like that. And, it, and again, it may have nothing to do with any of that, but my brain is so fast in making up a story that then, of course, as we know, it turns into a big spiral and that can get ugly. So then the rumbling piece of it would be for me to take a step back and say, okay, take a deep breath. I, I'm triggered. My mind is making up the story that he's mad at me because of this. What else could actually be happening? You know, it, it, you know, giving Chris the benefit of the doubt, maybe he just didn't see me. Maybe he's he had to rush off to go do something and wasn't paying attention, you know, things like that. And then the third stage is the revolution, which is now that I have that data, what am I going to do with that? And I think one of the things that often happens to us in, in medicine and why we absorb so much of this emotion, but most of us were trained to suppress and keep moving. So how many of us were taught, keep your head down and just keep going, you know, like, yeah. and, oh, and, yeah. I, <laughs> and I can't tell you how many of my colleagues literally were like, they would have literally like fevers, sickly, deathly ill and still show up to work, you know, or they, there was none of this sort of like aspect of self-care, self-compassion. And so Mm -hmm. again, it's one of those things that I, and, and then of course what happens is when we're that way, 
we turf that down to the people we're managing. So as leaders, we have to be really, in, um, in, in, in regards to knowing our emotional intelligence, we really have to work on this process because yeah. as a leader, think about how many times you get triggered. You know, someone makes a comment about the decision you made or criticizes you for this. Learning how to be able to digest that and not react in a negative way is so important. And I mm-hmm. think it's, it's getting, uh, this woman, Susan David wrote a great book called Emotional Agility. And she says, emotions are data, not directives. So again, don't let your emotions be the ones leading you to make actions. And how many of us mm-hmm. let our emotions drive us, especially right now, considering COVID and how stressful things have been. Yeah. Emotions aren't facts. That's what right. I've been told. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, and in your story that you make up that first story, you have to think about how much of that is fact and how much of that is assumptions, unconscious biases and past traumas that are affecting the story that you're making up. Mm-hmm. So Summer, if, if you're a physician and a specialist talks to you, like, you know, talks to you with a little bit of a, a harsh tone and you think if you're already suffering from imposter syndrome or have it, you know, think about the story your mind is going to make up. That specialist is, thinks you're an idiot. That specialist thinks that you don't know what you're doing, you know, mm-hmm. and, and, and and none of those things might be true, but that's the story that your mind is making up. And yeah. so how much of that do we carry on? It so do you think positive reinforcement makes people work harder and like as a boss or like Chris as one of the bosses of, of Pacific companies, positive reinforcement and, and pushing that positivity and to build that resilience, do you think that's a better mm-hmm way to work it? I think so. I think it definitely can be, but at the same time, holding accountability, because there is something called, there's something called toxic positivity. And I think we've all met people like that, where it's kind of annoying, you know, like they try to spin every bad thing and make it a good thing. And you're like, no, there's no good to that, but it is what it is. You know, so I think think we have to be careful not to also carry over into that toxic positive type of way too, because then, then that gets really fake and inauthentic and insincere. But I do believe that we have to be careful when, as leaders, that when we're leading, we're not attacking the individual and judging them, but we're focusing on the behavior. So again, that goes back to the emotional mm-hmm. intelligence work is, again, not judging the person's like they're lazy, they're not a team player, they're not this, but really looking at like, it's just this, this behavior that they're doing is mm-hmm. causing this effect, if that makes sense. And that's and where, how do we correct it? Yeah. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And go from there. But you know, yeah. how many of us, unfortunately, make judgments about our colleagues all the time? Like, oh, they're just lazy or they're just not good at that. You know what I mean? And and mm-hmm. we have to be careful not to do those things, especially as we move up in the leadership aspect of it. So Dr. Lee, I wanted to switch gears a little bit. Something I've always shared with candidates over the years and for physicians that want to be in a big city and you're in a big city, the Southern California Metro, you went from a protected, let's say HMO with all the referrals in, within network. And now you went to a, a independent group or group of some sort where you have to go out and kind of shake the bushes to get patients and where you're going to, let's say in the South Coast Plaza area, right. there seems to be plenty of doctors. So how are you going to go about to build your patient panel, given that you're probably in an area that has plenty of docs and UCI probably has a couple of family medicine docs coming out each year, staying in the area, our population isn't growing too much. What what are you going to do to build that practice? You know, that's a great question. And I'll tell you some of the things that I've learned from my colleagues as well who have done it too, is that a lot of it is honestly word of mouth. And right now, social media is a big way that people will get their names out there. Um, and whether they want to subspecialize in something like nutrition or, you know, wellness or whatever that looks like. But I'll tell you one of the biggest things that I find for me, at least that has helped me is word of mouth. You know, you actually provide good care, you connect with people well, and you'd be surprised. Everyone will, they will tell everybody. You know what I mean? It's really funny. I've had patients that are like, oh my gosh, I've connected with you so well. I'm going to tell my family about you. I'm going to tell my friends. And I can't tell you like over time, how much of my panel has built up just from word of mouth more than anything else. Because I think right now, especially you'd be surprised because of our primary care shortage, people are really challenged with even trying to get in to see their primary care provider within a decent amount of time. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of practices are even backed up. You can't even get in to see your primary care provider for like a month or two in some places. So that is access is definitely one of the nice things that we offer at our practices. You know, we can get patients in soon from their appointment time. And that definitely makes a big difference in terms of attracting more patients. Mm-hmm. 
I have a quick question. Have you noticed a rise in telehealth since COVID? For sure. Yes, definitely. And I think actually a lot of physicians are looking for more telehealth type positions because, you know, obviously it allows more flexibility. They can work from home. And so telehealth I could see is becoming much, much more popular among physicians, especially the younger ones who lifestyle is very important to them. And they want to not, you know, they don't want to feel tied down by having to, by their jobs and they want to have that flexibility. That definitely is a way for a lot of them that they're looking for. For sure. Do you think there's a negative to that though? I do. I do. And I'll be honest with you, a lot of times I feel like it's very hard to develop a connection with the patient just virtually. Like you can do it to a point, but I find that there's so much lost when, and I'm sure you've maybe felt this if you've ever had a telehealth visit versus an in-person visit, you know, at least from my perspective, I, you know, I'm, I'm not really able to read them as well. I can't see a lot of body language. You know, there's that energy that you get when you're seeing someone physically first and, and actually examining them versus just seeing them, uh, you know, I'll be like, Oh, can you push here? You know what I mean? But like, that's not the same as you do an exam on them. Mm -hmm. So I do think that there is some loss and I do believe that telehealth should supplement in person and office visits. I just don't think virtual visits is going to be the only way to go. I just don't find that that's going to be the way to at least provide the most best and efficient and effective care for patients in the long run. I think we need to have telehealth visits because I think it's an adjunct and in, in with the uh, in-office visits, but I definitely think you need the two together and not just completely rely on virtual visits, especially with the connection piece. Yeah, definitely. And Chris and yeah. I talk about this all the time because I do work from home part-time. And when I'm at work, I feel like it's there's such a different connection, you know? He can walk right into my office, look straight into my eyes. You know, we can get some so much more done. And um, I can see that same working with telehealth as well. Yeah, absolutely. I'll tell you with meetings, especially summer for me, when I go into meetings, I miss, you know, a lot of the work doesn't happen at the meeting. A lot of the work happens after the meeting or in at the break when people are having side conversations, you know, face to face. And so I'm there with you. I really feel like the whole Zoom concept is great, but I, but I just worry about the future because I feel like it's definitely taking some of the humanity piece out of our work, you know, if that makes sense. So again, don't get me wrong. I think virtual telehealth medicine is important. I just don't want it to be the primary source of where people are getting their health care, especially primary health care. And Dr. Lee, we see the same thing in recruiting. A lot of times in the past, we would actually physically meet the candidate because we wanted to make sure it was the right fit. It's trying to marry somebody just with a phone call or maybe now, well, let's just do a Zoom. It's different when you're in the presence of somebody. And so even in our industry, it takes away some of our ability to appropriately advise the candidate and the client to say, this is a good fit because we're missing some important information. Totally. No, no, Chris, I appreciate you sharing that. I also personally think that it takes away from the physician in these interactions because I can tell you a lot of my joy comes when I have the patient in front of me and we're talking face to face. I actually, I don't know, I could be wrong in thinking this, but I think burnout is going to be worse if everyone just did only virtual visits, you know, in some sense, because then it just becomes more like an interaction more than it is like a connection, if that makes sense. And so, you know, how much of our visit is the patient sharing something with me and me being able to like just touch them on the shoulder and be like, oh my gosh, that must be really hard or, you know, have to just give them a, a, like a cancer diagnosis and be able to give them tissue and give them a hug or something. Like you can't do that. Uh, You know, a lot of that physical connection piece is going to be lacking when you do these virtual visits. And then when you start looking at every patient as just a a transactional visit, then it just becomes a job. It doesn't become a calling. You know, the whole concept of that, to me, at least I feel like gets taken away in that, in that sense. All right. Well, Dr. Lee, for me, this was a, a great visit with you. I learned some things on your yeah. emotional resiliency. So I was very excited to be here today. Uh, oh, thank you so much. And I can't tell you, I've made, it's such a privilege for me to get asked to do these things. It's one of those things I love to share. And 
Definitely. I think there's and one of the pieces that I feel like sometimes we're lacking is a lot of times is that mentoring piece of like having more experienced physicians really mentoring and looking out for the younger ones. The challenge I think nowadays is healthcare has gotten to the point where I think a lot of the more experienced physicians are drowning, that they don't even have time to mentor a lot of times the younger physicians. So we really yeah. have to hopefully create avenues like this summer where you have podcasts like this, where you, you have these uh, places where, you know, younger physicians can actually just listen and hear stories because I find mm -hmm. that stories are sometimes the best things to do. And, and also being reminding that they're not alone. Because I think exactly. a lot of times I remember when I was a younger physician, I was like, am I the only one that saw like, you know, that am I the yeah. only one that feels like they suck or like that? I, you know, am I the only one with imposter syndrome or that mm -hmm. am I the only one that's burned out? And it was always nice to be able to talk to an older experienced colleague to be like, nah, man, I, I went through the same thing or I'm going through it right now. And it really helped to have yeah. that connection with some of the older, like more experienced physicians for me. And that's why we love having the stock lounge podcast because you know, 90% of our listeners are physicians, you know, or students, med students, fellows, residents, and they learn a lot, whether yeah. it be a, a doctor telling a case. We have another series called Ask the Expert, where they're, they're an expert in something and they, you know, give their knowledge. Um, so, you know, we talk to uh, hospital administrators and, and hear their side mm -hmm. of the story. So I think this is good what we're doing and, and I appreciate your, your kind words. Yeah, no, thank you again. I and mean, this is great. And thank you again for inviting me. This is such an honor to be here. Of course, of course. Thank you to all our listeners. If you'd like to be notified when new episodes air, make sure to hit that subscribe button. And a big thank you to Pacific Companies. Without you guys, this podcast could not be possible. If you would like to be a guest, go to www.pacificcompanies.com. Thank you.